I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hello, Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Welcome to Arcane Mark. To Arcane Mark. Player tools. How much is too much? So this is kind of a vague episode title, but it is in part because there are several types of too much that you can discuss. Generally, in a tabletop RPG, the GM has an outsized percentage of a role of determining what is too much. And when something has gone too far, in terms of just a huge variety of things, whether that is how much table time has been spent on any particular topic, whether, whether that, that is, is how much how much optimizing should be done for like how powerful characters are, whether that's like spotlight time for a given character, whether that's like, you know, emotional intensity, emotional intensity whether that's like, you know, how much detail are you diving into on certain aspects of the game, even if it's not about emotional intensity? Yes, it absolutely. It could be like, you know, okay, yes, this is too much tracking the minutia of survival. Yes, this is too much tracking arrows. Just pay a thousand times the cost of an arrow and we'll assume you never spend more arrows than that. Yeah, but if the players are considering from their perspective how much is too much, then they can really assist the GM with, with pulling things together. And when together. we say they, we mean you, because this is for you, players. This yes. is player tools. So... You have the ability to continue to watch and to continue to learn and to continue to determine when something is too much and you can help. And there are ways to help when you're figuring out that something is too much that are uh, more effective at um, assisting with um, the group's social contract and the group harmony and there are ways that you can do it that can be a bit disruptive to equally disruptive to the thing that's too much so that's why we wanted to have this episode to give you tools to figure out how much is too much and to figure out what you can do because you're not the gm and so ultimately the buck if there's like a conflict doesn't stop with you necessarily completely but there are still some great ways that you can indicate that something is too much Yes. So first of all, what you can do and how you can do it does depend a little bit on the preset social contract, which means if we kind of rewind back to session zero, one way you can help as a player with um, is to set things up in advance so that there's a good, easy, gentle way to talk about things being too much before you just get into it and something is too much and now you don't know what the correct way to handle it is. So for example, for a few different types of too much, if there is, you know, if there are certain content elements that might be that might be off limits, communicating not not just communicating what yours might be, but helping to foster and support a discussion among other players about like, yeah, you know, I was thinking that, you know, this kind of thing in a game is is not something that I would enjoy. Um, do other people have things that they wouldn't want to see, you know? So then it's not placing all of the mental burden on the GM to be, especially like when the new GM to think about like, oh yeah, you know, here's things to, to do. Working with the other players on the, uh, on having a more consistent like power level and role. Um, so if you notice that, um, you know, your character is, one of the problems you'll see is like, you know, one character fills the same role as another character, but they do it like, more or better or things like mm -hmm. that so like if you notice that you know you have you and another player are both going toward the same thing you know talking to that player to find a way that you can you can diverge what you're doing so it's so you're not going to be in a situation where you're, you're not setting yourself up with your builds to be in a situation where something is is an issue um you can yeah. also have things where like that arise uh you know whether whether in the beginning sessions or like a little bit later on with like the way that people like make choices for things that they do with their characters so like for example if you have someone who's decided that they want their character to be like a dedicated damage dealer who's gonna just do blast area effect constantly and everyone else is like oh my gosh this is like you constantly dealing damage to us or things like that that's why i got you a black that's why i got you a backfire mantle like that meme on reddit yes. that's like i got a present for the sorcerer Sister, it's, it's a, a backfire, backfire mantle. mantle it's a backfire mantle mm -hmm. uh, yeah 
So, so, and there's in terms of, uh, in terms of builds there, there's also in terms of like, you know, how much detail do you want to, to go into and these sorts of things. Like if you as a player know that there are certain things that are going to make you check out, then letting the GM know that, you know, for, for your perspective up front is useful. Like for me, for example, um, once a combat goes into like the two to three hour range, I do not have the attention span for that. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to get distracted and kind of check out and space out or whatever if I'm not, or like, you know, feel tempted to go off and do something else. Cause it's just like, oh my God, like this combat is still going or what have you. Or like if it's, especially if it's like a long and really tense combat, then I can find that to be super draining. So like, you know, I'll let the GM know and then the GM knows, okay, yeah, you know, I'm game to do those sometimes, but like, I would definitely wouldn't want that kind of thing to be every session and I'd probably want the session to be a bit shorter if it's focused around that sort of thing. I mean, if it's a final boss, like it's a final boss, right? But Yep. And so another thing you can do as a player, if if you think that there's not a lot of lines of communication that are open during session zero for like future communication, you could try to talk about putting in some kind of tool. And you need to make sure that if you do that, that it's something that works well for your group. So for example, one of the like well-known tools for communicating this other is too much is an X card. Mm -hmm. However, legit, legitimately the, the, the use of X cards as they are defined of you just put down the card, you say nothing, and then they have to um, like whoever is going just kind of stops and backtracks and kind of tries to not hit the X card is really, really non-functional for many groups. It works great for the groups that it works great for. And a minor tweak to it can make it work great for almost any other groups, which is you put it down and like say one word related to the thing that you, that you want to X. Mm -hmm. That's the main reason that people ha sometimes have problems with it is that it's supposed to be a no judgment, no you no statement made. Just put it down. But, but then many it can people be hard don't for know what figuring out what what was the problem, and then you're more likely the the GM is more likely to inadvertently stumble Repeat back into it, again. it because they didn't know what it was that was. Or the problem. if they're just like, I can't stumble into it again. That would be the worst thing I could do. Then they're just like frozen in in sort of like inability to move forward because they're like, which of these twelve things was it? Do I have to remove all twelve? But that mm -hmm. was entirely what we were doing. Yeah. So if if you your group may need to have that tweak where you know you're like you put it down and say spiders, mm -hmm. and it's like oh spiders was the thing. Okay, I can. Okay, so scorpions. Yes. And then they put it down again and say scorpions or uh, arthropods. Okay. Um, giant poison birds come down. And yes. Then if you just like. This is an example because I, I the X card is a great tool for a lot of groups, but I've seen people who are like it really didn't work for us for mm -hmm. that reason. That's no not a reason that they necessarily need to get rid of X cards. That's a reason to make a house rule for them where you um, where you state something about it. Or you could say that they they normally say nothing, but then if the person who got carded isn't sure, they can ask like. For clarification, they say, like, can you tell me what it's for? And then they say mm -hmm. spiders. So yeah. you can you can do something that will fit your social contract if you're using a tool like X card. Lines and veils are another example of a tool that's in the um the core rulebook and I think um, either the player or GM quite don't remember where it wound up mm -hmm. after the uh, remaster. Another one that I another one that I've that I've seen, I haven't personally used, but I know can be useful for some groups is like checklists that they have which is like you know these things are yes or no topics mm -hmm. up at the beginning that would be a bit more of a, a gm type thing but as a player you know that's something that you could potentially bring you can pose. say yeah. hey can we do this mm -hmm. and talk about how we're varying from the pathfinder core if you're using or the pathfinder baseline if you're using pathfinder and the pathfinder baseline as the shared understanding so that's kind of talking about topics that are too much for someone um, in terms of when the game has spent too long on one person, this gets a little bit tricky for players. It's one of the most tricky things to do unless you are the person who uh, a lot of time has been spent on. So if you want to talk about this more, we had a sharing the spotlight player tools previously that was entirely about that. So mm -hmm. I don't want to get too in-depth about it, but where we talked about if you're the one who has it, then you can 
suddenly start involving someone else. We have like an entire hour on that. So yeah. I want to actually kind of not do that one specifically and just point you to the sharing the spotlight episode if if um if you need more advanced tips on that one mm -hmm. um now if something has gone on too long and it's not about spotlight it's like no everybody's involved in this kingdom building phase it just took four hours and only one person actually cared about it then yes that's a little different than sharing the spotlight. Yeah, so let's get into that a little bit. So first of all, um, one of the things that you can do is when things, when things, you notice something tends to be dragging, um, one of the things that can happen is it can get into a cycle where players are getting more and more checked out and so it's progressing more and more slowly. So if you go in as a facilitator and then are like, all right, you know, so to summarize... My understanding, you know, and then check with the GM about like, you know, so this is, we know this fact and this fact and this fact. Um, and then like try to bring, bring it back into being more focused. You need to find something that works for your group. Sometimes the thing that works for one group will actually be a problem for others. So what Linda described is my way of trying to help when something's dragging and I'm the player, which is to consolidate everything into some kind of like a, a, a table or Excel file or chart where like or we, like a bullet we list were one time like preparing like for a war and i put it all down and i'm like okay so having put this all down the only two characters who can do task x are this uh, are me and this other person and so we put it down we found the most constrained where it's like okay only linda can do this one so she needs to do that one mm -hmm. and then we, we we were like any questions so um any questions what do we want to do on the ones that are flexible some groups that could be a problem because people will be like, well, no, I don't want somebody doing this organization. I want to like make all the decisions myself. There's another solution that I tend to think of as being terrible and like the worst possible way to go about this. But for some tables, it actually is the right solution, which is being disruptive and doing something else where it's just like, all right, we're setting up defenses for this war. It's taking a long time. The play of the dwarf is like, I put an explosive in our wall and blow it up just because the player is getting bored, you know, or they just yeah. start doing it. Thing. It's like, I get into a brawl with the workers. Uh, so I consider this to usually be a serious problem that will make everyone at the table angry with you if you do it. Some people and tables like this, though, where it can be like a lighthearted moment that like changes things and shakes things up. And maybe it's a lawful versus chaotic yeah. player thing. I also think, you know, there there's different degrees of, of doing, like, because that one where, where you did the spreadsheet, like, that was absolutely what was the right thing for our group, but was, like, a little bit of a, a little bit more heavy-handed. Um, so it may not work for other yes. groups in the same way it was very successful for ours. But there's also things like, you know, even if you're, so, like, you know, making a bullet, so if, you're, if it's be happening because everyone's indecisive or whatever, it's like, okay, you know, so, you know, checking with the GM, like, you know, are these the facts that we've just, you know, these five facts are the facts that we've discovered or whatever to try to bring things back to like the, uh, a, a productive uh, right. discussion where people can, and or, then, and or then to at least else, yeah. when everyone's aimless, be like, okay, look, the three things anyone around here at the table have proposed are A, B, and C. So if you have another proposal, say that say that now otherwise mm -hmm. we should but, like, like decide a between a, B, what and we're going to do between a b and big it's like yeah so especially if you're like you know if if it's like a b and c are all things that we would want to do then I, I might look at a b and c and be like okay so you know looking at this it looks like a b and c are all great things that we can do um and it looks like they're mutually I, exclusive I, or maybe. like you know, maybe they're mutually exclusive or maybe you realize like you know and it looks like you know to check with the gm like is it true that we think we maybe can only do one of these or like you know check with the gm about like okay you know is it true that like our chance to do a is only like for today and tomorrow but we could go back and do c next week um so if we wanted to so if we wanted to do a and then c we would be able to do both and then if they're like yeah then you know people finding a way to get people to do be able to do more of the things that they want to do um by by taking a look at what sort of those constraints are or like if things are mutually exclusive then you know having uh you might have your your character work you know i i often like to work with the gm on this you know you might have your call for like you know my character would like to see if they know anything about like the the state of politics around here because if people are like well you know Plan A is to like barge in and, and break in and like plan 
B is to like try to do a social approach and like you know my character would like to know if there's anything that 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 she knows about the politics around here that might suggest that that one of these plans might be more successful than the other so like if there's a if there's a uh, if there's a dispute then trying to move the group toward gathering more information that would help to help them to make a decision right so that's how you can try to figure out um, how much is too much when it comes to dragging in one section and trying to get things passed. Now, the last topic that I was thinking of for how much is too much is how much is too much when it comes to like optimization character capabilities. Mm -hmm. That's part of the group's social contract. Like our group in PF1, uh, we played with essentially just... Make, you can make as optimal of a build as you want, but the group had a social contract that we collectively banned things that were just so busted that it was just over if yes. they existed. And that we also could decide together that a particular thing was being too powerful and then that character could rebuild that thing into something else. Yes. And because of the nature of our group's social contract, a lot of times it wasn't the GM who was the origin of saying something is too powerful. More often than not, it might be the the player themselves who was doing who was like, yeah, this thing I'm doing feels kind of busted. Uh, mm -hmm. Or like, you know, we also had things where the GM was like, yeah, you know, this ability that you took seems like it's not as powerful compared to some of the abilities of the other characters. Let's work out a way to make it more powerful so that it, it's more on parity. That's right. So as a player, you can get involved by just looking at how the thing that you're doing may be outperforming another character with a similar role mm -hmm. or vice versa it's harder when you're the one who isn't going uh, uh um like beyond the bounds of too much because if you are then everyone will be like okay if you go back to session zero and make sure that your group has a social contract mm -hmm. where you talk about this then it's easier th to make it not sound like a sort of like jealousy or sour grapes situation yeah another thing you can't you can do if is um you know to with your with your character's tactics and what they choose to do seek opportunities to bolster the profile of players whose characters are not getting as much spotlight so you know if there's if there's crush or the barbarian who's doing all sorts of damage and you're a spellcaster you know you don't necessarily need to be like oh crush or does all the damage all the buffs go on crush or you might have have other strategies you can use that are about like helping the sniper do things that are more effective or things like that so you can choose to like moving or you know doing other things that could you know you don't, right. you don't like you could yeah. haste crush or but if you cast fourth level uh fourth rank invisibility on um the sniper then maybe they all, every single one of their attacks is a sniper attack because they're now invisible and they get sneak attack on it yeah so shaking up some of the strategies that you use can help put focus on people who because yeah i mean i find that those kinds of things like people are more likely to feel like you know, one of the characters is being more over the top in their performance, if that becomes then the strategy that you rely on combat after combat and that gets stale. Whereas a, a thing where different characters shine in different combats is going to be a lot more fun. Absolutely. And you can decide, you know, and, it, you know, maybe you're a spellcaster, maybe you're deciding, like, you know, who are you going to give a flank to? Or, you know, are you going to try to set things up for with, like, a feint or some other, some other tactic that's going to advantage things? Right. So we gave tools on how to so sort of try to create a good social solution when something is too much. But let's step back. How much is too much is also the name of the episode title. So how do you figure out that something is too much? So when it comes to a uh, when it comes to something that someone is going to put down a card, it's based on how they're feeling mm -hmm. and um, or that they're going to be like, wait, this feels bad. It's hard to tell as another player, but if you can, if you're good at sense motive in real life and you see it on their face, you could be the one who says, "Hey, let's stop doing this." I think it could make someone uncomfortable. You don't even have to name the person who you mm -hmm. think is feeling uncomfortable, or you could say it's you. Um, when it comes to how much time in something, before you look at the look at the body language of other players. I mean, some of the things can be more overt, like if a player is literally on their phone. Like, and it's not someone who's usually different. on their phone. And it's not someone who usually, who has a, you know, an issue with constantly checking out during games or whatever, then, you know, or somebody who's like going to another room or like, you know, they, they, or like, 
they are clearly not paying attention to what's going on because when you address them, they need like updates on what has happened for the last half hour, or they ask questions that indicate they haven't been paying attention, or things like. Or that. Or at the beginning of the um the subsystem, somebody like smushes grapes with their feet, and they go into the cellar, and they come back later with some wine that they made out of. <laughs> out of that and start drinking it um yeah you're like wait a minute how we've long been have we this been for doing a long this time game? yes um, um so, so like noticing other people being checked out or like if they seem to be like testy in what they're saying or like yeah most often what you'll see with those kinds of things is is players seeming like distracted or paying attention to something else yes and not and not engaging with the game itself whereas um, with power level usually you can tell that something is too much when it is like when linda said um if it's repeatable like almost no matter what the encounter is and very reliably just win 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 mm -hmm. um that probably might be too much especially if you can do it either by yourself or with like one other character who is doing one of the parts of the combination or you know you might notice that a player is making comments that indicate that they're feeling jealous or frustrated it's like oh yeah you know this person that character has it handled, like, I'll just do whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. That's right. So those are... That That can make it more overt. But mm -hmm. sometimes you can find... If it's just a go-to, because it's super reliable, if you, like, are shockingly winning quickly before any of the opponents get to use their cool abilities and you get to find out what those are, mm -hmm. uh, it can feel exciting and good that you're like, yes, we got rid of it, but eventually you can realize that you may have some part of what you're doing mm -hmm. that is... That and another person to, to watch there is the, is the GM. Because, you know, sometimes you'll have a table where the players are enjoying the raffle stomp, but the GM is getting, like, yes. really frustrated. And it's like, oh, why? If the GM's like, wow, I spent hours on this, and you guys just crushed it. And as a player, you're one of the only people other than the other players who can help the GM there because they may be in a situation where they have, they've read all the GM advice, they've listened and they've, they've heard, you know, the GM is, uh, the GM is supposed to be making it fun for everyone else. Mm -hmm. So they put their own funds subservient to everyone else that are just like, well, no, it's fine. It's fine. And they don't want to, they don't want to say something's too much or they don't want to be like the, um, the tyrannical GM that people read about online uh, uh, who ruins everyone's fun. Because they're not willing to let the players win or yes. like whatever. Yeah. Because there's a, there are some, some sort of like vibes of that in part because of generic advice. Cause there are, there is a way to go too far as the GM easily mm -hmm. in part because some players do just want to run roughshod and are kind of like tyrannical in their own sense. And so for some GMs, they can have anxiety about saying, hold on, I think this is too much. And so they would really appreciate it if a player is the one to say that in the same way that if you say you're uncomfortable by something that you think is making another person at the table uncomfortable, then that can help them not have to do that if they're anxious about talking about it. Mm -hmm. Particularly, this can be the case if uh, you have someone at the table who is marginalized and there is something that is uncomfortable for marginalized people uh, uh, like like that player at the table and you're not, then if you talk about it, it can be easier than for them to talk about it in some cases. Yeah. If you step up... Uh, and, and and take a stand there. So Yeah, or if you notice something like, you know, people... You know, people who are behave people who are like putting pressure on another player like you know i've been at a table where where people were like getting annoyed at a player because they because they were slow to add up their dice and were and were like causing an issue mm -hmm. for that and then it was like you know this is not appropriate and so like you know if you notice something that if you notice an inappropriate social dynamic too then speaking up so that the player realizes yeah they're not alone. it doesn't have to be the gm yeah. it can be you can be mm -hmm. another player and do that sometimes it can be more effective because the gm is sort of expected to do something like that whereas mm -hmm. when the other player does it can like Sort yeah, like I had that happen dynamic. at a convention. Like I was a Paizo person, so like the GM's apologizing to me, and it's like, uh, don't apologize to me. Like, mm -hmm. Apologize to her. 
uh you know because it's like that was the that was the issue and i needed to i needed to get that behavior to stop because it was it was seriously a problem that's right um and then we were able to move on past that so yep absolutely so we've talked about how to figure out how much is too much how to try to deal with it when something is too much Mm -hmm. and some of the differences about the fact that you're a player and people think wait wouldn't gms figure this out wouldn't this have been gm tools but it's Mm -hmm. actually more important um and difficult for a player because the gm is sort of expected to yeah be but the gm this. is also juggling so many different things yes. that if you as a player can notice when something is going too far and then and then act upon it um you know then you can you can help to make that experience so much smoother the gm will, will probably be very grateful assuming that you do it in one of these sort of more graceful ways rather than just be like gm your thing is too much um so like these more graceful mechanisms where you use it as part of the group dynamic and the social contract yeah and if there is an and if there is an issue you know making it about your experience rather than universal like you know just say i you know i'm feeling you're you know like you know i'm feeling kind of stressed out with the difficulty of some of these combats rather than you know your fights are too hard than your fights are too hard exactly you know, just, just usual communication. You're a cruel and unusual punishment, which GM. <laughs> is um, disallowed by... Uh, but you were un- your GMing is unconstitutional. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> yes, yeah, but I mean, that's just general life advice. <laughs> it applies here, too. Um, that's right. Because GMs definitely spend a lot of time working on games and... Folks can get precious about about their games and about their characters. Yes, the wrong way to handle when something is too much for you is to send a letter that that starts with the best part about America to, <laughs> um, when you don't like what your GM or the other players are doing. Oh my god. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So yeah, um, that's that's basically where we're at with that. Um, Shall we say goodbye to YouTube? Yes, let's. All right. Bye, YouTube. See you next time. Bye.